Okay, my name's Eric Sergo. I'm the general manager of operations for Chevron, uh, and I handle the North Sea assets and our non-operated assets in Denmark. Um, I'm going to share a few of uh, incidents that have occurred in our operations in the last two or three years that I think you can take some very specific um, lessons from. So before I get started, I just want to check in the, in the, in the room here. So how many of you are uh, involved in, in engineered work scopes and or operations and or maintenance uh, activities offshore? Good. And, and uh, how many of you are just in the oil and gas business? No hands at all. Okay. So I think I have the right room. You, you folks can affect change is, is what I'm gathering from the first set of hands that went up. And, and these are the types. Am I doing that? Okay. These are the types of incidents that I think you can, you can learn from. Um, one more comment. How many of you have read Failure to Learn? So about 10 hands. So this is the book that was written post the, the Texas City refinery fire, uh, the BP incident that occurred a few years ago. If you have not read this book, you need to go and buy this book and read it. Um, it, it talks about a lot of things in our industry uh, that we need to learn from, and, and hence the title of the book, Failure to Learn. So I'm going to give you a couple of things you can learn from today. The part of learning is there's one thing to present the information and for you to actually read it and absorb it, but when you close the loop of actually doing something is when you've learned something. So either you take a test and you pass the test, or you actually go out and check some of the things that I'm going to show you today, and you make sure that, that they're all right in your operations. So that's the learning loop, is I'm, I'm going to give you the freebie, and then you're going to go out and check your operations and make sure that this can't happen to you either. So we had two events that I wanted to share. Um, our Alba North operations. The slides are busy, so I'm going I'm to tell you what happened. So we have these uh, H2S injection quills that are installed on the platform because we deal with H2S and the gas. Uh, these are retractable devices that an, that an individual can actually um, uh, retract the device out by, uh, by unsetting a lock nut, bring the device up, shut the block valves, and then you can get the quill or the corrosion coupon or, or that item out. I think most of you are probably familiar with these items. So we had a, a contract team working um, on separator A on ALBA. These are fairly sizable separators. They contain a lot of fluid, uh, a lot of gas, and unfortunately in my business they also contain a lot of sand. Um, so the group went out to do their work. Uh, they were on an elevated platform, Chevron employee at the base of the platform, two contractors on the platform. And they looked at their work procedures, which told them at a certain pressure um, what they could do and what they couldn't do. They knew what the pressure was on the vessel, and they proceeded. And the first thing they do is they loosen the stuffing box or the, or the nut at the top. And at that precise moment, the quill ejected. And it went through and stuck in the ceiling. And we had a 1.6-inch opening now of ga natural gas flowing out on 150-pound, 200 you can imagine their reaction, okay? In, in a great, simple scenario, they would have simply leaned over and shut the valve, and that would have been the end of the event. But of course, they panicked, as, as, if, as if all of us would have. They got very frightened, they backed up, they climbed down the stairs, and they evacuated. In the control room, the gas detectors went off. Um, control, the control room lit up. Um, and the OIM and the, and the, um, OT, or, or the uh, production team leader were in the area and immediately worked with the CRO to shut down the whole platform and go to blowdown. It was a 600 kilogram release, enough to probably level the platform. Okay, that's a really big release. It dissipated over time. As it moved through the decks, it set off gas heads all the way through the decks and then it evacuated out the top. Scared us all to death. Frightened everybody on the whole platform. It frightened me when I got the phone call at the beach that <laughs> said evacuation of platform was the, was the uh, call from the automated system. Okay? So a very simple job task. Very simple. It's been done many, many times. Uh, and, the, and the folks who we hired to do this, this is what they do for a living. So why did it eject? So there's probably two root causes here. And I'll, I'll skip to the 
There's a schematic of the, uh, the quill assembly itself, but I want you to look at the tip of this quill. That's the part that's actually in the line. You see those threads? There's supposed to be a nut that, that attaches to those threads. So when the quill goes into the piping, there's a nut that keeps it from ejecting through the packing. It's, it's called a blowout preventer. And the nut was not there. Why was the nut not there? No clue. Was it, was it not installed when, when they first installed the quill three years ago? Uh, did it vibrate off? Um, I, I don't really know the answer to that. All I do know is that you as leaders and as folks on the platform need to ask what's the worst that can happen. And for a very simple uh, operation, something we've done a lot of times, the worst that can happen is you can have a 600 kilogram release uh, very quickly. So the lessons, uh, the, the summary of findings are here. Uh, vendor personnel undertaking very routine, uh, routine event. Blowout preventer was not in place. Uh, there's one other, pe one other nugget in here, and these, are, these quills, you can use a retraction tool. And the retraction tool actually helps release the quill out in a very controlled manner. The procedures uh, that the vendors uh, use in this situation say that if it's under 200 PSI, you don't really need the retractor tool. And so they tend to not do it because it, it's a lot of rigging, it's a lot of equipment. If it's up in the piping, it's hard to, it's hard to get up there, so it's, it's difficult and challenging. So the, so the lessons for us is, is don't assume anything. Um, don't assume that these quills uh, have their blowout preventers, and you need to use the retracting tool probably all the time. As engineers and designers, you need to put the quill where they can actually get the retracting tool on it. And you need to make sure the quill is not near an ignition source, uh, and, and remotely close to an ignition source. So the designers and the, engineer, the engineers and the operations folks need to ask what's the worst that can happen. OK, any, any questions on this one? Very straightforward. Do you have quills in your business? Anybody? Am I the only one? No, I got some shaking heads. Yeah. So go check them. And when you want to check them, if you, if you got to assume that there's no blowout preventer, then wait for your turnaround. Send your people out when you've got the whole system pressured down. Take it apart. Make sure it's in good serviceable, position, uh, good serviceable condition. It has the necessary pieces and parts. Put it back in service or move it to a location where you know you can use the retractor uh, tool. So you don't have to run out and do it tomorrow. Do it during your turnaround. But go check these things. So I've given you information. Time to learn. You got to go do the do part. OK, another great incident. I've been here for three and a half years. I've had three big incidents. You may have heard of the Erskine fire. How many have heard of that? Awesome. How many of you went and checked your rings? Mm. So I shared, did you learn? Go check your rings. The, who's from Total? Where's Total? Total, did you guys check your rings at, at uh, Elgin Franklin? Yes, you did. Did you find four rings that were about to fail? Yes, you did. So go check your rings. We're not going to prevent hydrocarbon releases in the UK if you don't complete the circle of learning. Go do the work. Do it during your turnaround. There's tools that can help you detect metallurgy while you're online. Get a program. Get it done. OK, another quick one. So I have this uh, FPSO at our captain field. And um, during a tanker offload, which we've done over 500 tanker offloads, uh, we had a very sizable spill. About a 200 barrel spill to deck. We had about 10 liters to see. Huge spill. Why did that occur? Totally normal operations. We put the, we put the uh, metering skid into service. We're, we're pumping oil over to the tanker. And then the operators come around on routine and find a huge pool of oil moving down the deck. Shut in operations. So what, so what happened? So the metering skid's designed to 17 bar. Um, it has a bandlock closure on the filter housing. So this is, the meter, this is the, on the metering skid. This is the filter that the oil flows through before it goes to sales. It's kind of the last place to, to catch debris and trash, right? It's got a, a, a band lock closure on this, 20, it's rated to 20 bar. Our system never goes above 9 or 10 bar. So we never really put this thing under extreme pressure. But we have this big spill. 
We had leak tests. We do leak tests regularly on this metering skid. Um, all the time we do leak tests on it. No issues. This is the filter housing. These are not great pictures, but you can see um, the design, the top design, and you can also see how a lot of debris can get in and out of these things. You can see some trash on the seals. But what I really want to point out to you is that this is a pressure to seal system. So when it's not under pressure, it's not normally sealed. It actually just kind of sits. Gravity kind of works against you and it's not sealed. So when you pressure it up, it, it seals. Do you have these filter housings in your operations? Do any of you sell oil? Do any of you have metering skids? You probably have something like this. It's a band, top, a band type filter housing. I suggest you get rid of it and buy the new and improved one, and I'll, I'll show you why. Okay, so we found a couple of things on this incident. Uh, because the seals are energized when you have pressure, that leaves you vulnerable to possibly debris getting under the seal. And so then it seats, and it's not completely seated. It's got something stuck in there, and the oil can spray out, right? And we do get a lot of backflow because you, you are pumping to a tanker, and uh, you're, you're going to drain things back and reroute. We also use the pumps on these skids for uh, moving cargo between tanks. So there's a lot of opportunities to get flow in the, in the opposite direction. Um, so I, I, we've got a root cause here on the debris can be washed between the seals and the seal face when the seals are relaxed. And there's no segregation between the bandlock lid and the open filter basket to stop debris from getting in. So now I'm going to really bear my soul to you, all right? So I, I presented this to the president of uh, Chevron um, Europe, Eurasia, Middle East, because whenever we have an event, you get the pleasure of talking to the president about it. And the president looked at our root cause and he said, you didn't get it. You, you, don't, you didn't get there. Go back. And we're like, well, you know, we hadn't really had any big events on this. We hadn't really had this before, 500 offloads. You know, look at all the debris. And he said, you didn't get it. So I went back and we did some more work. It took us about six months. And what we did was we went and mined all of our data. So I'm, I'm about to give you another lesson, another free learning here. We mined all of our data and we found that we had actually had four small um, oil spill events associated with the metering skid that our operators had saw a weep or saw oil on deck and, they, and they, when they put it in the database it got attributed to the metering skid. It didn't get attributed to the, to the bandlock filter. So we went back and talked to people, and they're like, oh, well, yeah, that oil, it weeped out of this part here. So we, had, we actually had five events, not one. We had four small ones and one big one. And guess where all of those spills occurred? They occurred on stream one of the two-stream filter housing. So stream two, never an issue. Stream one, always an issue. So it doesn't rule out debris, but what does it tell you or make you think? It makes, me, it makes me think that there's probably something dimensionally wrong with filter one. That it probably isn't quite as tight and as well designed and manufactured as filter two. It just leads me down a different path. The, 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 the RCA findings were to replace these, and we're not changing our path on that. But one of our other RCA findings was to, was to take the time to put mesh in these filter housings to keep debris from getting to the seals. And I'm starting to wonder if that's really going to solve my problem, if there's actually a dimensional issue. With that said, the manufacturer makes a new model that is not pressure to seal. It's always sealed. It's always tight. It's more like a, a Greylock type clamp. I suggest if you have one of these, you upgrade. And don't tell me, oh, we've never had any incidents on it. It's been perfect. We've done 500 offloads because um, that ain't going to fly with my president. All right? Any questions on these? Okay, uh, get the book and read it. Failure to learn. Um, very good information. Thank you.